Welcome to Leaders of All Pairs. My name is Kirsty. And I'm Phil. You join us as we run through our initial thoughts and setup of Red Rising. Red Rising is a Rising. fascinating little game. Um, yeah. Um, by Stonemaier Games and is a very interesting, straightforward game. Straightforward? Is it straightforward? Ooh. Ooh There's um, one to talk about later. Yeah. Um, for up to six players I'm not sure I play it with six people but up to six players um, and just it's pretty um, and you'll talk about that later yes, I'm so sure <laughs> um, so when we talk about Red Rising we'll have a we'll have a brief overview of some of the trickier rules um, that might be really challenging in rules explanation and this one has some real challenges for the first time player that we'll talk about as we um, have the board set up and, and get to know the game a little bit better. So, so first things first, yeah. let's do the setup. Okay, over to you. You're going to take the board from the box and place the board in the centre of the table so all players can see. You'll then take the wolf's head and open the top to reveal the helium tokens inside and the draw pile will be shuffled and placed in the centre of the board. Get a sovereign token, the dice, and the first player counter and place near the board in a convenient location. Each player then chooses a faction, either randomly select or pick the one you prefer, taking the tokens of the appropriate colour and your quick reference sheet. The rocket token will go at the start of the fleet track, and then each of the columns will randomly get dealt two cards face up to start it off with the second card overlapping the first card to leave the title in place. Once you've completed that, you will then be dealing five cards to each player to start as their opening hand. And with that, you're done and you're ready to play Red Rising. Welcome back. Glad you could join us. What? It's fair. No, so there we go. We have Red Rising set up and ready to play. Um, just a few notes on some of the things that you'll see in front of you. Um, these are cards, and we'll talk about those more in a little while. Uh, this is the draw pile. You will be creating a discard pile. Um, it, it's going to be off to one side. doesn't really matter where it goes. It needs to be accessible to all players. Um, so you'll be creating that somewhere around the board. This is your little pot of helium tokens. Um, this is your first player token. This is the ascension token. In, sovereign token. Sorry, sovereign token. I was thinking um, it's a wonderful world with ascension. Oh. Uh, my apologies there. And in your player area, you've got your, um, uh, your faction with your faction power. That happens when you gain the sovereign token, typically. Uh, you've got a little uh, quick reference card in your player colour. You have 10 influence tokens, you have a rocket on the fleet track, and you have 5 cards to get your game started. So, how does a game of uh, Red Rising work? Well, really simply, uh, we'll go through this pretty quickly. On your turn, you are going to be um, playing a card from your hand, typically, and you're going to be playing it to one of these four columns. You may have a deployability, which allows you to do something when you deploy the card, and that action is specifically deployed from hand to one of those columns. Then you will take from another column and take the benefit of that column, and the benefits are slightly different. So in Jupiter, if you take a card from Jupiter, you can't take from the column that you've played a card to. Um, if you were to draw from Jupiter, you'd move on fleet track. If you draw from Mars, you'll claim yourself a helium. If you draw from Luna, you will claim the Sovereign token. And if you claim from the Institute, you will place one of your Influence tokens on the Institute to start collecting influence. Um, so, play a card, take the Deploy effect, draw a card from one of the other columns, and take the Column effect. That is it. the game. That's all there is. And with all games from... Uh, yeah, certainly for the, the, the Stonemaier games that have been designed by James Stegmaier, your turn is pretty straightforward. You take an action and it moves on. It, it, the game moves at a fair pace. The end game condition which triggers the end game is achieving either one player achieving two 
um, end game conditions. End game conditions are seven helium, seven influence, or seven on the fleet track. So if one player has two of those, the game ends. If across all players, seven is achieved across all three, that triggers the end game. Each player's playing until we've had exactly the same number of turns, so you typically play ground to the first player again, and then you'll total up points. And that's when the game gets tricky. Yes. <laughs> so, to say that I've explained the game to you in, what, maybe two minutes max? Yeah. Is fair? Yeah. I've explained how to I play the so. game. Would you want to play from that explanation? Yes. Are you sure? I've, I have played before though, so... Okay, for the first so time, would you like to play from that explanation? Um, I can talk about my first time. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. So... Sure, uh, everyone, everyone wants to know about your first time. Yeah, I'm right. Anyway, so, my first time experience of this game was... Um, there was very much an anxiety as to which cards are the correct cards. Um, I wasn't necessarily sure on a few things which I just want to quickly point out. So each card is unique, there are no two of any card. So once a card has gone or been taken by someone else and not been put back, that's it. Change your gameplay, don't concentrate on that card again. That's really important as well, some of those cards in look quite similar, yes. like especially the grey cards, they're all quite samey, they're yeah. all kind of like soldiery people with guns, typically. Yeah. The other thing as well to note on this game is that yellow and gold look very similar, silver and grey look very similar, and the copper and orange look similar. So you'll note that it's on the cards, copper and, brown. copper and orange, and copper and brown, so yeah. you'll note that the cards, very light in this section here have the, the colour so if you're not sure and if you are collecting a specific colour or you need a colour to gain an, um, a specific point just make sure that what you think is the colour is the colour because I agree. I've messed up with that uh, let's see an example of that in my hand because that might be quite so yeah okay so here we go here's yellow and gold <laughs> Actually, yeah. Yeah. so these are yellow and gold um, gold and yellow and they look very similar especially when they are buried in these piles they can yeah. look very similar so just be aware just keep your eyes on the prize mm -hmm. so to speak one thing that also is very good about the cards obviously we'll, the, the light of the cards we'll talk about in a minute but near the edges of, if, if there's a specific so you'll see on these two cards here down the edges there are uh, like stripes of colour or a particular character. Now the first thing that threw me off is I don't know the story of Red Rising. No, and it's worth saying that this is a series of books um, and the actual the, the game and the characters are all based on that series of books. Neither Kirsty or myself have ever read those books, so we are lacking a little bit in the history. Yeah. But it doesn't stop the game being enjoyable. No, so if you don't know who that character is, all you need to do is look down near the bottom and it will tell you what the added benefit is. So for example, this blue one, if with Pax or Telemannus or Pax, um, you get an extra 10 points at the end of the game. I would not know that that was Pax from no. Adam, to be honest, in that picture, but it always describes at the bottom what the bonus is. But as a, pic, you know, a quick um, iconography there, to know that this is gets extra it. points with a red or a gold it helps yeah, to it see that little yeah so anything that might influence <laughs> that card there is a little sort of half chevron thing that yeah. gives you an idea that something else will influence the point scoring off that card if it has a cross through for example like this one here it's really hard to see the cross through sometimes there it means that you're going to get negative points if you were to combine the two but again you don't need to worry about that image, it does state it on the bottom. So for example, this character, Evie, when she's with Darrow, which is the top character here, you get 15 extra points on top of the 15 that she's already worth. However, if she's paired with Mickey at the end of the game, it's minus 15 points. So it's just, it's all written at the bottom, but quick iconography, especially for colours, down the edge is worth noting. So, also worthy of note, um, I think really important, this is not an easy game to teach. And it's not an easy game to teach because the, you know, the game itself plays really smoothly. That's not where the challenge is. The challenge is in end game scoring and how to generate that score. Mm. 
Now you are going to score points for your location on the fleet track, you're going to score points for the amount of influence you have at the Institute, and you're going to score points for the amount of helium you've drawn. And that's really straightforward and really simple, but that's only going to account for probably a third of your score, maybe not even a third of your score. The rest of that is going to come from your hand of cards. And as Curse has just been explaining with some of those cards, how you've got like a 15 point Eevee there, and if she's with Dara at the end of the game, that's going to be a 30 point card. Each of the cards has different ways of scoring extra points. And they're all detailed at the bottom. Some of them are grey cards, typically are accumulators. So if you treat the outside, actually, this one's not one of the ones I was looking for. Um, oh no, it's, um, you get five additional victory points for each gold on all locations. So you're dependent on your, on your opponents, really, for helping you generate those extra points. Some of them are very straightforward. Um, uh, if you have X, you're going to be fine. If you don't have X, you're going to have some negative points. Mm -hmm. That's um, the uh, Karanus card. So why is this game so difficult to teach? And why are people <coughs> likely to have a really tough ride of that first game? Well, that deck's quite big. Yeah. Every card's unique. We've already said that. We haven't actually seen all the cards. Probably We're on not. Fourth play, and sometimes a card from my go, Oh, I haven't seen that one before. Yeah. So you end up in a situation where you're trying to accumulate a score in your hand, and you probably want to be holding on to something like two hundred points in your hand. Now you start with a hand of five cards. You can increase that hand size. Once you get past seven, every card is also worth an additional minus ten points at the end of the game, just to keep you a little bit more honest. Yeah. Um, but don't worry about that. If you get your accumulator as well, you'll always go, each card will be worth more than ten anyway. Um, so it's worth holding on to. But actually growing your deck in a two or three player game is actually really quite challenging. Yeah. Four or five player, you're much more likely to see the cards coming through that allow your hand to grow in size. Mm. I think Darrow is a good example. He allows you to take two cards yeah. and increase your hand size before you place down and then yeah. carry on and continue the game. But so, there aren't many. No, there aren't. That. And it's hard to find them. They're, they're tricky to come by. And mm. actually, whenever you get an opportunity to increase your hand size, they're cards you should be looking for. Yeah. But they're also cards if you're playing a, you know, a, a tough game, you keep hold of those until you don't really need to get rid of them. Yeah. So... The challenge with this game is to, is how you explain the accumulated scoring because people can have a card in their hand that says it's worth another 20 points if this card comes up mm. but then you have to explain to people that there's like a hundred other cards in this deck and the odds of that card coming up might actually be quite slim so it might be worth getting rid of that card but they get rid of that card and then the next card someone sees is the one that they were waiting for and then you've got a frustrated player. And this game kicks that level of frustration quite high for first time plays because you are trying to figure out how to accumulate a score without knowing what's in this deck of cards and your the vast majority of your score is coming from this deck of cards. Very much so. It's, it's worth noting that different factions tend to have different powers as well. So obviously there's, there's two aspects where the factions matter, it's, I think. So, for example, there are, is it six different factions? Oh. Six, yeah, six, it's got to be because it's six players. Six different factions, and each of them, so the first part of the faction is each of them have a different power when they have the sovereign token. So that allows, for example, as a Mars, I can then get to, every time I get the sovereign token, this little one here, when I can take that into my hand by play, taking from Luna, or if it is a power, um, allows a power that. yeah, yeah a deployment allows that, I get to take a helium token, and so on. So, and if I was then to still hold that sovereign token, I then still get to take it. It doesn't. It have to be that yeah. it has to leave my hand and come back. So each of the houses, factions, houses, whichever, have a different power based on the sovereign token. Yes. The factions also come into play in the colours. So, for example, the blues tend to be relating to the fleet track. Yeah. And they will not they'll advance yourself at the fleet track, but they will also evenly advance others as well. Yes. So, for example, there's a card, I'm not sure if it's this one actually, advance twice up the fleet track, 
than all other players advance, advance wants. So you've got, you've got a benefit, but everyone else is benefiting from it as well. And that's one thing that this game does very well, and that's it kind of evens out the playing field, I feel. Yeah. It's good in that respect. And uh, there are other, obviously, colours. Um, so, for example, uh, the pinks tend to give you influence if you banish cards. And, and yeah, there and are they tend to interact powers. with other cards quite yeah. a lot as well. Yeah. Um, so... The game itself is actually, I think, really straight. You know, to play is really straightforward. Mm. To play well, it's really hard. I and think we need to play some more games of it. Yeah, and I think that's fair. And I think it's one of those games where the more you play, the more you you understand the game. The game is not designed for like um, a quick casual get out and play, no. put it away, and then bring back a month later. It's designed and really benefits from regular, consistent plays. But to support that. It can a game can end in 20, 30 minutes. So you oh, can actually yeah. be through a game really quickly. Yeah. Um, we played a game that actually felt really disappointing. Yeah, it did actually. It made me question the game a little bit. And Kirsty got herself stuck in a mechanic that <laughs> just moved her up two tracks really quickly. And the game was probably over in 15 minutes and there'd yeah. be no real time to plan yeah. your hand of cards so that you can maximise your score. It was just... Oh, it's over. Oh, we're done. Yeah, and it was. I was like stuck in a rut, and I couldn't change it because I, whichever power it was at the time meant that if I had the sovereign token, I was just like influence, influence, influence. But then the cards I, the only cards I had, just purely like you know, tr uh, chance of the draw were blue. So I was just rocketing up the fleet track, and I couldn't do anything about it. There was no way I could stop myself from ending the game so quickly. So that is something that you just need to be aware of, that it can happen. It does feel disappointing, but you have the game and then you move on. Like in a lot of Stonemaier games, you as a player are in charge of the end game, of triggering that end game, and that's great. But the cards sometimes can lock you into a strategy that mm -hmm. means that the game is over in the blink of an eye, and those games honestly will feel very disappointing. Now... <laughs> That's not to say I don't like this game. Mm. I do like this game, mm. but I think it has its challenges. It certainly has its challenges for first-time players who may not like it the first time they play and might not want to come back, which would be a shame. Yeah, definitely. I think this is one that you definitely need to give several players, commit some time to it, yeah. have some time just look through the cards, familiarise yourself with the characters, with the cards, with their abilities, there what is, the different factions There do. is absolutely no hardship to looking through this no. deck of cards because the, the artwork, artwork is just stunning. Yeah, fabulous. And mm -hmm. I am sure they all portray characters, and in fact, I, know, I know they all portray characters from, this, from the, the novel series, but the artwork is just breathtaking. And the personality that's captured on mm -hmm. the cards is really nice. Um, the, each character, you almost feel... Um, like the, their power almost feels linked to who they are and their the sort of, yeah, you know, sort of, you know, diplomat, like a diplomat, mm. it looks diplomatic. So um, one thing that we are trying to do with our playthroughs is we're trying to play each faction so that we can experience, yeah. because the factions have so much, you know, power, as I was just saying, that it's worthwhile, no, but what I'm trying to find out is, it, is there an alpha faction? And in the final thoughts, we will discuss that because once we've had time to play all of them each, I think that will be something that's worth discussing. I do have one bug there okay. with this game. And um, being short, as I am, being five foot nothing, when, um, depend on table, this table's good, but we've played it on other tables, this fox container... And that deck of cards. And the deck of cards. Their positioning means that, depending on where I am, I struggle to see the cards... And I know that's just me being a short ass, and I should probably just no, I don't think sit it on is. a cushion. I, I was sat but, um, last time I played over at this angle and couldn't mm, see past the deck of cards. Yes, you can wonder. move them off the board, but there are spaces for them on the board, and so yeah. you can actually place them there. I'm not, I'm not going to complain too much about that. Yeah. <laughs> if that's the only thing, like, if that's the only negative I can come up with this game, then that's pretty good. So, so my, far. my negatives, tricky to, tricky to explain, mm -hmm. a really, really difficult first play. I agree with Kirsty on being able to see past some of these things. Also, graphic design wise, some of the text choices are difficult. So the blue um, that says blue on almost all the blue cards is really hard to distinguish because it's against a very dark background. The brown is a, the brown on some of the ones as on well. Brown background. Yes, some of the you know the brown's got actually a faint glow around it, so you can see it better. But actually, 
it might just instead of instead of actually locking in the colour on the mm. text, it might have just been easier because the borders are the colour as well. It might have just been easier to use a clean white font. But however, I do understand if it was for yeah. colourblind purposes, it's it fine. does allow you to see it. But again, if you are struggling in particular colours, you're not going to see that easily anyway. No. So it would have been, as you said, would have been better in white. And there's a lot of information going on the cards and fundamentally giving themselves very little space because of the quality of the artwork and I'm not going to complain about the quality of the artwork because it is stunning. So for me, is this a game for everyone? No, it's definitely a game for card players who've played mm -hmm. card games and who understand the interaction and are comfortable with interactions amongst cards. It's not going to be a game to introduce that kind of card play to people. It's no. it, it's too difficult to to get into it. Yeah. It might be that something like It's a Wonderful World is actually a better starter game before you get into something like this because the cards are a little more simplistic. Uh, they have yeah. a little less complexity to them. Um, but for people who are gamers, who understand it, card interaction and like card interaction, this game will really float their boat. Yeah. Um, there's a huge amount going on and every game can feel quite unique um, as you start to build your, your final hand to score those big points. Yeah, and uh, we're, we're going to do a run through, aren't we, and a play through and yeah, we'll see do a play how through. we'll maybe do these, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. So overall, I can heartily recommend that you give it a go. Mm -hmm. If card games aren't your thing, this might not be your first port of call. No. And for newer players, the first teach is really difficult and the first couple of games are going to be really challenging. But bear with it, it's definitely a game that definitely improves with multiple players because you familiarise yourself with the cards, you get more used to the concepts, you start to understand the scoring capacities and generally you get to see more of the artwork the more that you play and that's always a good it's, okay, that apparently that's a good thing. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Um, a lot of our viewers watch our channel but don't subscribe and it really helps us out if you do. So click on that subscribe button and just do us a little favour. Yeah, And don't forget we're also on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Just search for the Small Pets. Thank you for your time today. See you soon everyone. Bye bye. Bye.